Today we have uh, Alan Gasparovic uh, from Union College, who's going to be talking to us about uh, the medial axis and image analysis, the homological simplification problem, and gerrymandering. Thank you very much, and thank you to the three organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you to all the rest of you for being here today. I'm gonna be talking about three different applications of the medial axis. The medial axis was my first love. That's what I did my graduate work in, in differential topology and singularity theory on the very theoretical side of things. And so now I'm gonna talk about some more recent work um, in, the, in the applied side of things. So I'll talk about a natural image analysis application and then um, using the medial axis to attack the homological simplification problem and then we'll do a little gerrymandering at the end. So the star of the show today is the medial axis, which is a uh, topological geometric structure that was introduced by an engineer, Harry Blom, in 1967. So the, the medial axis you can define in any dimension, but I'm just gonna be talking about 2D applications today. So the medial axis of a shape or region omega in R2 is the set of all centers of circles um, in the region that touch the boundary in at least two places, or at the endpoints of the medial axis have a single degenerate tangency to the boundary. These are just some medial axes I found in the wild on the internet. So the medial axis has a lot of good advantages. It captures the intuitive shape structure. It has the same homotopy type as the region. Um, unlike other shape representations that are boundary based. This gives you access to the interior of the shape. But a drawback of it is that it's, it's uh, sensitive to boundary noise or little perturbations on the boundary. So there are other alternative definitions of the medial axis. There's a singularity theoretic one in terms of absolute minima of the distance function. Um, Another way of defining it is if you imagine your region is covered in grass and it's in the middle of a dirt field, and some jerk comes along and lights a fire all along the boundary of the region. As the fire propagates inward, the places where the medial axis, uh, oh sorry, the places where the fire quench, quenches itself is gonna be the points on the medial axis. And this grass fire flow is um, one way that people actually uh, compute the medial axis. So the way that I'm gonna be computing the medial axis in two of the applications that I'm gonna be talking about today is by approximating it with the Voronoi diagram. So let me just recall the definition of that for you. If you have a set of points in the plane, then the Voronoi diagram divides the plane up into regions where the region associated to the point PK is gonna be all the points in the plane that are closer to that point than to any other point in the set. Um, the medial axis is a subset of the Voronoi diagram, and there's a, a fact that for sampled curves in 2D, the Voronoi vertices and the corresponding distances of the sampled points converge to the points on the medial axis and the radii of those bitangent circles as the sampling becomes um, dense enough. Okay, so we'll use the Voronoi diagram to compute it. And then there's a dual notion um, to the Voronoi diagram, which is the Delaunay triangulation of that set of points. So it's a triangulation such that the circumcircle of every triangle is empty. So no other point from the set is in an in interior of any triangle. So it's the dual graph of the Voronoi diagram. I have ripped this picture from Wikipedia, as one does, to illustrate this. So we have the Delaunay triangulation on the left and the Voronoi diagram on the right. So the vertices of the Voronoi diagram correspond to the, the centers of those Delaunay triangles. And then you have an edge between two vertices in the Voronoi diagram if the corresponding triangles share an edge in the Delaunay triangulation. Um, so both of these things are gonna come up in two of the applications that I'll talk about today. So let me get started with the first application. This is joint work with Aaron Chambers and Catherine Leonard from 2018. And we were interested in segmenting, articulating objects in images using fragments of the medial axis. So that was exactly our goal. We used the medial axis to extract 
objects that articulate from natural images. So our overall plan was we needed to come up with an edge map of the image, use that edge map to make the Voronoi diagram, and then extract pieces or fragments of the medial axis from that, and then combine those little fragments into a coherent valid whole shape like this polar bear here. So that's our plan. Um, a lot of work has been done showing that the medial axis is useful for representing pre-segmented shapes in 2D. So if you already have shape contours to work with. There has been a lot of work done in this. Not These are older papers from 2004 and 2011. I just happen to like these papers. The 2011 one in particular kind of inspired us. These are papers I liked back in the day in grad school, but there are plenty of others I could have cited. So uh, the first one, Sebastian Klein and Kimia um, did some shape recognition by matching the shock graph. So it's like the medial axis, except it has some additional structure on it. You just have some information about the radial vector, the radial radius information. And then Trin and Kimia used a fragment-based generative shape model to segment objects in images. But again, they used pre-segmented shape contours to form templates for their medial axes, and they did the shape matching that way. So very little work has been done involving medial axes from unsegmented images. Um, there's probably good reason for that, but yet we, we went ahead with it anyway. So um, the medial axis, the properties of it are only well-defined when you have closed shape contours, and closed shape contours are difficult to extract automatically. Um, but we did some previous work, Aaron and Catherine and I and Carola Wank and a couple other people back in 2015 where we did some image recognition using medial axes extracted from arbitrary natural images. So this work um, kind of builds on that. So the initial steps of our procedure is first we do some smoothing of the input image. And then we used a popular segmentation algorithm called NCUTS. Um, that's just an illustration of the result of the NCUTS segmentation algorithm on that picture right there. It's known to over segment. Um, and in particular, it often, I don't know that it's good, you don't see it too much in this picture, but it often puts parts of the same object into distinct regions. So it'll put like, you know, a leg or something in one part and then another piece in another part. So our goal is to take those different parts and combine them into a coherent whole shape. So after we get the edge map from the output of the NCUTS algorithm, we then compute the Voronoi vertices and the edges associated to those image edges. Then our goal is to take that Voronoi graph and extract relevant salient fragments from it, stitch those together into a tree, we're assuming our shapes are simply connected, and then use that as the medial axis of our shape. So our plan is to join nearby medial fragments by clustering the um, Voronoi vertices using a k-means clustering, and we're gonna cluster by LAB color, um, and then the question is, what do you choose for your K? Well, we want to choose K automatically. So we want an automatically determined number of clusters. And in order to um, figure out what K should be, we just did a little clustering. We just did a little um, zero dimensional persistent homology in LAB color space. And the largest gap between successive points in that persistence diagram the number of um, points above that was our number of clusters. I see Don has his hand up. Yeah, so does the output of your segmentation, does it give you just cuts or does it give you segment, like subsets of pixels? Um, it gives you subsets of pixels. But that's like, so the groups, just because I guess the medial axis would be well-defined even if it wasn't nice pieces, right? Right, exactly. Boundaries? Yeah. So, so, but you do get entire pieces that are connected? Um, 
Yes, for the most part, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so then we have our different clusters and then on each of those clusters, so so far we just clustered just by color. Um, so then on each of those clusters, we compute the induced subgraph, little medial fragments. Each cluster may have multiple components. So then we have to decide um, which components should be joined together. So we wanna join components that are uh, spatially proximate in some way. So um, if we were to go back and do some more work in this area, we would want to um, do some more, you know, thoughtful analyzing of interactions between disjoint medial structures to better determine when we should combine them. But what we did here was we inserted an edge between the two closest Voronoi points in two components, provided that those points were at least as close as the length of the longest edge in either component. And in practice, that worked well with what we did. Okay. So we stick components together based on, um, you know, proximity, spatial proximity. But the problem then was that this often, this procedure often resulted in an invalid medial axis for a simply connected shape, meaning that we would have loops in our medial axis. This happens when the um, segmentation algorithm finds boundary points in the interior of the shape. So to get rid of those points and to get rid of the loops in the medial axis, we, um, what we did was we traced the outer face of the medial graph, detected any cycles. For each of those loops, we identified which boundary points caused that loop to occur. We, we figured out which of those are in the interior of the loop and deleted those. And then we recalculated the medial axis points from the boundary points that are left, the good boundary points. And then we connected that, um, which is now a tree with no more loops, back to our, our original medial axis. So I have just a little picture here to show you. So I'm illustrating it with a high contrast picture here with this dancer just to illustrate the method. So here's our dancer. This is the results of the end cut segmentation. Then when we did our k-means clustering, again by LAV color on the Voronoi vertices, these are the different, we found that k was four in this case, and so the different clusters are colored differently. So that main um, dancer is in the dark blue. So focusing on those points, um, this is what we got before our loop removal procedure. So you can see we've got some cycles there highlighted in the magenta. And then after we did that process that I talked about, about figuring out those bad boundary points and getting rid of them, then we recompute our medial axis structure, and then this is the end product for that. So I have some more results here to show you. A woman doing yoga, a polar bear, a dog. So for example, like the woman doing yoga, her legs and her arms were put into distinct pieces by the segmentation algorithm. And so our procedure computed those different fragments and then stitched them back together into a whole shape. Okay. So um, on the one hand, this is good. We're demonstrating potential utility for combining parts of the same object that were put into distinct regions by the initial segmentation. Like this whale tail here, there's that non-uniform coloring on the, um, in the interior. So the end cuts output in the middle there has a large amount of you know, that extraneous detail inside the main body. And then that's the result um, at the end of the day of our thing. But then the horse down there, so we get an over-segmentation of that horse um, based on the fact that we have Voronoi points in the background um, belonging to the trees in the background there that were assigned to the same cluster as the body of the horse based on color value since we were just using color for clustering. Um, so, you know, if we were, again, to go back and do some more with this, we'd want to use more than just color. We'd want to use things like texture, or some sort of statistical moments within Voronoi cells. Just something, you know, more additional there. Um, Alan, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, I was gonna go on to my next 
topic, so it's good to ask okay. questions. I'm sure. So just a question about the medial axis. So if I have um, an ellipse, you know, the medial yeah. axis will just be this horizontal line, which you, you sort of see that in the whale tail, you have this horizontal part, but then you also have yeah. these vertical fingers. So right. is it sort of the case that, you know, the ellipse is um, convex, but whenever you have like a little bit of conca uh, concavity, I guess, then you're necessarily going to have one of these fingers shooting yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And especially, you know, if you have some bumpiness, like you can see the boundary of that whale tail has some like, you know, bumpiness, it's not nice and smooth, you're going to get like big set theoretic changes in the medial axis because you're going to get those big branches shoot up to take care of those little teeny tiny bumps there, or any, like you were saying. Thanks. Convex or concave parts, yeah. Okay. So that's good. So now uh, I'm going to move on to the, the next topic. So this is joint work, again, with Aaron Chambers, but also with David Letcher, Tao Ju, Hannah Schreiber, and Dan Zhang. This is very much ongoing preliminary work, probably too early to talk about, but here I am. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're, you're in on the ground floor with this project. So here we go. This is a persistent shape for the homological simplification problem using the medial axis. So let me start by telling you about the homological simplification problem. So it asks, given two shapes or like two simplicial complexes, you could also say um, L, a subset of K, can you find an intermediate shape in between L and K? such that the homology of Y is isomorphic to the homology of the inclusion of L into K, the smaller thing into the bigger thing. So another way of saying this is, can the persistent homology group of the pair L and K be realized as the homology of some intermediate shape or simplicial complex? So this is one way to approach the problem of topologically accurate simplification of a shape where the goal is to take, you know, like a noisy shape and simplify it according to, to reach some desired topological structure. The solution of the homological simplification problem is known to always exist in two dimensions, but, um, and it can be solved in polynomial time, but it's NP hard in general. So even in R3. So Dominique Catali and Uli Bauer and those others there in 2013 looked at this question for simplicial complexes and they showed that it's NP-complete even if K is embedded in R3. And then Aaron Chambers and um, Tao Ju and David Letcher, who are on the paper that I'm, the project that I'm talking about and some other people back in 2018, came up with some heuristics for the homological simplification problem for voxelized shapes. So they came up with a way of defining um, a core inside the shape and a neighborhood of the shape for a given voxelized shape. And then they wanted to find a shape in between that had um, the Betty numbers as close as possible to the Betty numbers of the persistent homology of the inclusion of the core shape into the neighborhood shape. So again, NP hard in general, but in practice, their um, work that they did greatly simplified the noise of a shape and simplified the topology. Alan, can I ask a question? Yep. So, so is, it, is it sort of known that such a Y always exists or is it like For known two that, dimensions. And then in, um, in higher dimensions, it's not known that, whether a Y exists. It's known that there are examples in R3 where it does not exist. I see. And then the NP hardness is sort of like, I could be either like deciding whether such a Y exists or not, or it's like computing such a Y when it does exist. That's right. I see. Yeah. Done? Thanks. So, so I had a conversation with Afra Zomorodian about this about 10 years ago. And um, he had the following conjecture. And I don't know, maybe you could tell me if it's known or not. He, yeah. he conjectured that if you took L and K and you replaced them with their very centric subdivisions, that you could always do it. Do you know if that's you even like that you could always find such a Y as a subcomplex? Know, the very centric subdivisions. I feel actually like his conjecture was that he, he said he was positive you could do it if you take the subdivision <laughs> twice. 
Um, Wait, so say it again. Positive. If you could do what twice? Take the barycentric subdivision and then the barycentric subdivision. Oh, around. do it twice. Oh. Yeah. Um. I th I, do you know I, of any results in this? In this? I think the answer is still no. I mean, I, so to, in Dmitry Morozov's thesis, which I guess would have been was, was that more than ten years ago? Probably. Yeah, around that time. Um, he showed that like um, there exists three manifolds such that no simplification exists. His examples were like the Poincaré homology sphere and some stuff with knots, not complements. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. But yeah, I'd have to. Yeah. It's a mysterious question. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So here's our objective. Again, we're, we're in R2 for now. Our goal eventually is to, when a solution exists, um, like in R3, we'd like to extend results to that. But for now, we're just working on R2. So X is a shape, a piecewise smooth bounded shape in R2. Epsilon is some fixed radius. We have a thinned version of the shape, which we'll denote by X minus Epsilon. So that's all the points inside the shape such that the ball of radius epsilon at that point is still contained inside the shape. And then we have the thickened version, x epsilon, um, which is the, for every point in the set, you take the ball of radius epsilon around it. And then the m will always indicate the medial axis of whatever object you're talking about. So our goal is to find a shape y that achieves the following three objectives. So again, we want y to be in between the thinned and thickened versions of the shape. We want the homology of y to be isomorphic to the homology of the inclusion of x epsilon into x minus epsilon into x epsilon. And it would be nice if we could show some results about like x and y being geometrically close or y being geometrically nice in some um, still to be really firmed down way. <laughs> Um, so in other words, for, the, for number two there, this means that y has the homology of x minus epsilon except for those features that die when it's included into x. So that should say x epsilon. Okay. So we were kind of inspired by the, you know, usual standard way of dealing with noise removal and shape simplification, which is the standard morphological operations of opening and closing. Um, but the problem with opening and closing is that they can create additional topology. Um, so let me just talk a little bit more about that. So here we have our shape in R2. So the erosion and the dilation are like our x minus epsilon and x epsilon. This figure I pulled from a recent paper, so the, the red is that the erosion and then the dilation is in green. And opening, the morphological operation of opening is you first erode by epsilon and then you dilate by epsilon. So what does opening do? It's going to remove small components and it also blurs like the convex corners of a shape. And then the dual operation there is closing, which means first you dilate by epsilon, then you erode by epsilon. So closing is going to remove little holes, and it's also going to smooth concave corners. Okay. Um, equivalently, you can define opening in this way. So if you um, if we let r of x be the distance from a point x, um, to the boundary of x, so that's the local feature size, then the opening is, you can actually first erode the shape by epsilon so that you get down to x minus epsilon, and then take all the points on the medial axis of x minus epsilon and grow balls of radius equal to the local feature size at those points. Um, and then you could, I only put it on for opening, but there's you know, sort of an analogous thing for closing. So opening and closing can introduce new topological features instead of simply reducing the existing number. So they might not simplify the shape in the way that we'd like, and it won't have the right homology like I was talking about earlier that we wanted. So just a little illustration here. Let's say your original shape is on the left here. 
and then our rotate shape, x minus epsilon is here. So then if you were to open that, you'd get this. So you would lose this, oh shoot. You'd lose this little piece right here, which is good, but then you would have you know, two distinct components here. So we'd like some sort of topologically correct version that's you know, has the nice advantages of opening, of being sort of, of having a smoothing feature and being, you know, in some sense close to the original shape, but we wanted to have the right topology. So, um, our first attempt, so we just, and notice it's called first attempt, so then I'll talk about our recent work improving it. So our first attempt was just for simplicity, let's just assume for now that X is a finite union of balls the medial axis then is just a set of straight edges. Um, and M is the medial axis of X, X minus epsilon. So then C, I'm gonna let C denote the medial axis of the X. So here X is this dark red shape. C is gonna be the medial axis of X intersect the complement of the thin shape. So the thin shape is over here in dark red. And so C is the blue pieces here, the part of the medial axis of X that's you know, not part of the medial axis of X minus epsilon. So, and again, we just started with first the question of, let's just start with the thin version and compare it with the original shape and find a shape in between the thin version and the original that has the homology that we want, the homology of that inclusion. Um, so our algorithm said, okay, we're gonna sort the edges in C by increasing thickness. So what do I mean by thickness? The thickness of an edge in the medial axis is the minimal value that that edge disappears at while the shape is shrinking. So like this edge is not as thick as this one, you know, the part that would go in here, okay? So we'd sort it by thickness, and then we have this sort of cue where we line up our edges by increasing thickness, we remove an edge from the medial axis of X. If it kills a homology class, so for example, like with this shape, we want no loop at the end of it because there, even though there's a loop in X, there's no loop in um, X minus epsilon, but we do want one component at the end of the day rather than two components because this component is gonna die when it enters X. So we would remove an edge in C if it kills a homology class, so like if it kills that loop, or if it just doesn't affect homology. Um, otherwise, if it would create homology, we're gonna reinsert it at the end of the queue and come back and revisit it later. And then we'll stop when every edge would create homology that we don't want. Then that resulting thing, so the medial axis of X minus epsilon together with these new pieces from C, is going to be the medial axis of our shape y and then we would build y from that medial axis so meaning we would take you know balls of radius equal to the local feature size so let me illustrate it with this example so here's our shape in order of thickness so the first edge we would deal with um, would be this one and we would remove it because it would kill the loop that we don't want so that's a good thing then next that one would go away, but that one doesn't affect homology, so we're good with that, so we'll remove that. This next one, you can see that would be a problem if we remove that, because then this, that would um, create a new component here. So we will stick that back in, we'll stick that edge back at the end of the queue and come back to it later. As we move on in our queue, then that little one will disappear, so that's, taken care of. And then the next one would be this one. But this one, if we removed that, then we would have two components and we don't want that. So we have to put that one back in. And we come back to that edge and that doesn't affect homology now. So we'll leave that off. And we want that one. So that medial axis that you see there, including that green part, would be the medial axis of Y. And then Y would be, unfortunately, I don't have a figure of Y, the end result, but if you grill the balls back around that medial axis, you'd have something that looks similar to X, but you wouldn't have this part connecting them in the middle. So it has the right homology. So it seemed like this was working pretty well until we came up with a bad example where it doesn't work. So 
let's say this is our shape right here. Again, just a finite union of balls. There's the original medial axis. Let's say epsilon is pretty big, so here's our thin version, x minus epsilon. So we want one component, we don't want that loop. So our algorithm, the result of it would be this. So it has a good medial axis that we want, but then the problem is when we would just naively grow the balls back to form our shape y, those balls would touch each other and we'd get that loop back that we tried to get rid of. So even though we have the nice, you know, connected path there connecting our components, we don't have the right homology. So we want some way of splitting apart those pieces, but what we had at the time, you know, wasn't doing it. So then our new approach um, is this. So, so first take care of little small fills of little holes that shouldn't be there, or removals of components that shouldn't be there that like would exist in X. Now I'm going back to um, the question of we want to find an intermediate shape between X minus epsilon and X epsilon. Okay, so X minus epsilon and X epsilon. So after taking care of smelling of filling of small holes that shouldn't be there and removal of little components that shouldn't be there for the right homology that we want for Y, then we consider the following two sets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this simultaneously. Um, with this, let me just, okay. I can just see Don. <laughs> All right, so this is what I'm going to do. Can you see both of these things? You can, right? Can yeah, we can. That's over here, okay. So, um, well, all right. So consider the following two sets. So we're gonna look at um, X epsilon minus X minus epsilon. So the, sh the region in between X epsilon and X minus epsilon intersected with the interior medial axis of X epsilon. And we're gonna look at that same in between region intersected with the exterior portion of the medial axis of X minus epsilon. So the portion of the medial axis of X minus epsilon in the complement of the shape. So let me kind of simultaneously give you uh, an example. So here's our shape over here, this black. This is our original shape. And now we want to do, you know, some simplification on this. So first, here's the X epsilon in red. So this is the, the thinned version. So like this little component over here that was in the original shape is gone when you thin it. Um, and, you know, um, this loop that was here in the original shape and this one are gone when you thin the shape. Okay. And then here in blue is the neighborhood, the X epsilon. So this one um, would still have this component and, and this one, but now these two distinct components before are now one component in the bigger shape. Um, and we also have, we still have this loop over here in the big shape and this one, and we also have a new loop here. So none of those are what we want. And also this little loop has been filled in, in the blue shape. So, um, maybe I'll take out my original shape here. So, now we want to look at the, um, those two medial axes here. Let me just kind of scroll down so you can see this. So now, what we want to do is we want to find subsets of those sets A and B with good, with the right homology. So we want two sets, X minus epsilon union, some portion of the interior medial axis of X epsilon that is homotopy equivalent to the um, larger thickened shape X epsilon minus some subset of the exterior medial axis of X minus epsilon. So let me show you what I mean there. So we would, we would get rid of um, this loop right here and we would get rid of this component because those aren't in the final shape x epsilon 
and then we deal with the rest of the problem. So we don't want like this loop and um, this one and this one. So the orange here, those are portions of the exterior medial axis of the red, x minus epsilon, okay? And then the blue are portions of the interior medial axis of the blue. Did I say red before? I meant? The orange is the portion of the medial axis of x minus epsilon, the red. And then the blue parts here are portions of the interior medial axis of the blue, the thickened part. And so what we want is to um, remove this orange part. So that's going to be part of our B. We want to remove this orange piece right here so that um, when we grow the shape back, we don't get that loop. And we also want to remove um, this orange part right here to prevent that loop from forming in x epsilon. And then we want to um, remove this orange part right here to prevent that loop. Then we want to add this blue part. That's gonna be part of our set A prime, which we're gonna to add to the medial axis of x minus epsilon to connect up these two components. And we also want to add this little blue part right here to x minus epsilon so that that'll connect up those two components. But we only want to add this blue part here and not this one over here because we don't want a loop. And the way that we choose to add this blue one and not this one is that this is, um, this one is a little bit thicker. So we add the thickest one. Okay, if you look at the original shape in black, that edge is not as thick as this little piece here. Okay, so then at the end of the day, um, our set S is going to be a subset of the interior medial axis of Z, where Z is that in-between region, X epsilon minus X minus epsilon. So we're going to take the medial axis of this in-between region, but where we've corrected it, we've done those additions and removals that fix the topology. And then S is going to be a subset of that medial axis where we just take points where their bitangent circles touch um, like both the red and the blue, not like solely the blue or solely the red. So here is the resulting shape. So this is what we get by doing that procedure. This has the right homology of the homology of H minus epsilon being included in H epsilon. And here's our original shape in black. You can see they're similar in some places, but it you know, gets these components together. Um, there's no loop in the purple over here and over here. And we've gotten rid of this little hole here and so hole. Okay, so why is the shape with that boundary surface? Any questions? <laughs> it's easier if you get to like play around with the shapes and spend more time drawing this all out. But. No, should I move on? Sounds good. It's really nice to demo. Thanks. <laughs> how, how are you drawing all that? Um, well, David Letcher is the artist, and this was in Ipe. Uh -huh. He's very good. <laughs> All right. So now for my last thing I want to talk about. This is work with an undergraduate student of mine at Union College named Mushan Zhang, and she's great. And so this is about detecting gerrymandering using the medial axis. So we're familiar with gerrymandering, it's the act of manipulating the boundaries of an electoral district so as to favor one party or group. So um, the Massachusetts governor, Jerry, redrew the state senate district lines, allegedly to benefit the Democratic Republican Party. So this is a um, political cartoon illustrating that, that his map looked like a salamander, so hence gerrymandering. Um, so there's different kinds of gerrymandering, partisan, racial, incumbent, they're all bad. 
Um, there are, you know, there have been a number of Supreme Court cases involving gerrymandering. So there are different constraints according to different Supreme Court rulings. Ideally, there should be essentially equal population among the districts. There are topological constraints. So the districts should be connected unless you have islands or something where you can't and simply connected. There's geometric um, constraints, which I'll talk more about how districts should be in some sense compact and they should preserve communities of interest, which is a little vague, and respect things like geographic boundaries or political subdivisions. So there are a lot of different compactness measures for gerrymandering. The former Justice Stevens said, substantial divergences from a mathematical standard of compactness may be symptoms of illegitimate gerrymandering. But what is compactness? Um, so, you know, many measures have been proposed to attack this. It's one of those things where it's more, you know it when you see it. So this from my former state, North Carolina, shout out to Red Mila and Don who are here <laughs> living in North Carolina. This has been fixed, but this was the previous map of uh, District 12 in North Carolina. So you had Durham, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, all the cities basically in North Carolina in one ridiculous, very non-compact looking district. So there are different ways to quantify compactness. There are measures of isoperimetry, so the famous polesby popper ratio compares the perimeter of a district to its area. By the isoparametric inequality, it's less than or equal to one, and it equals one only on perfect circles. So you know, there are criticisms of this one. There are criticisms of every compactness measure. This one idealizes circles and, you know, maybe perimeter can be large for good reasons, like in population dense areas or something. There are also measures involving area or area dispersion. So Hoffeller and Groffman presented one option which compares the area of a district to the area of its convex hole. So if your district happens to be convex, that would be exactly one, but that doesn't mean your district is compact. Like maybe it's you know very long and skinny and traverses the whole state or something. Um, and then back in 1961, an old one divided the area of a district by the area of the smallest circle enclosing the district. So again, that one idealizes circles, and I guess can be gamed. So here's the one that inspired my student and I. So we found this paper by Kevin Knudsen, um, shout out to Kevin, and his student, Ian Blanchard, who was also an undergraduate, who used the medial axis to measure the degree of what they call meandering of a district. And I think there was a court case actually that um, focused on meandering specifically. So they used the medial axis to come up with a measure of compactness. So they called it the medial hole ratio, and they compared the length of the medial axis of a district to the length of the medial axis of its convex hole. So this one, the ratio will be greater than one. Um, there's a lot of good things about this ratio. One thing, uh, or just a couple of things that they said, you know, were drawbacks of it is that, well, one thing is they used QGIS software to compute the Voronoi diagram, and I think they had ran into a couple of issues with that. Also, this is, you know, it's sensitive to noise. So as we were talking about earlier, when Henry was saying that, you know, you're going to get a lot of these branches of the medial axis. Um, so they do do some smoothing of the boundary and some pruning, which they discuss in their paper, but, but still um, it's sensitive to noise and also the their ratio for large districts districts of great area were inflated maybe overinflated. so we thought you know it's a good idea to use the medial axis to come up with a measure of gerrymandering so here is our proposal and it's based on i can't go 10 minutes without mentioning aaron chambers in this talk so this is work of aaron chambers and David Letcher and Tao Ju and some other people from 2011, where they introduced this significance measure on the medial axis called the extended distance function. So here's our little po point x on the medial axis. Let x be a medial point contained in any continuous path f in, a, in your medial axis. And then let r sub f of x be the shortest distance to a boundary point 
through the axis via the path F. Okay? And then you do that for all the different paths. And the extended distance function, or the EDF for that X, is the largest such value of RF of X among all paths that contain X. So here it is illustrated. Here it would be this value here. So, you know, EDF basically measures how deep into a shape a point is, um, or the amount of sideways shape expansion. It's the half length of the longest tube, tube centered at X and contained entirely inside the shape. Um, it's an extension of Blum's grass fire analogy for the medial axis. So here, the way that Aaron and um, et cetera envisioned it is, you take your medial axis and you imagine setting fire to the ends of the medial axis. And then as the fire propagates geodesically at a uniform speed along the medial axis, the EDF for a point X is gonna be the burning time of that grass fire. And in fact, in later papers, they called it the, burning, the burn time. So a nice thing about the extended distance function is that it's noise insensitive. It's stable under small boundary perturbations, little tiny, um, perturbations and little tiny shoots are not going to aff really affect the value of the extended distance function. So we said, all right, let's just um, use that extended distance function, compute the EDF at every point on the medial axis, and then just do a simple two means clustering to group points on the medial axis by EDF value. So at the end of the day, we get a separation into central points, kind of ones that are more deep into the shape and non-central points. And then C is the region in the district D where we just fill out, we take all the points on the medial axis that were classified as central, um, and we get the Delaunay triangles to fill out the region. And, um, and then we can compute the area of that region just by computing the summing up all the areas of those Del and A triangles. So the EDF ratio of a district is, you know, in the spirit of Knudsen and his student, the area of the district divided by the area of the central region. So in much time, I'll just show you a couple results. So, the data I'm gonna be talking about in this is congressional districts of Pennsylvania in 2015, and then after the map was redrawn in 2018 to hopefully improve things. So what um, Kevin and his student did was they presented this sort of four tier categorization of gerrymandering where category one meant yeah, no real explicit evidence of gerrymandering or, mandering or low probability. Category two was it's potentially gerrymandered Category three is, yeah, probably it was gerrymandered. And then category four is the worst offenders, almost certainly gerrymandered. And so we did a similar thing where we um, imposed these intervals based on the data that we had and sort of natural groupings into category one, category two, category three, and category four. This district right here is one of the districts from Pennsylvania in 2015. This was the one that had the highest EDF ratio. Um, so here's the central region in yellow and then here's the rest of it. It was around three point something. So just in the last couple of minutes, I'll just show you our results. So these are the ones that our algorithm or our ratio said would be low probability of gerrymandering. Um, so you can decide what you think about that. Maybe this one has this little suspicious tail, but you know, this whole region was kind of grouped in the same central region, so. This is um, category two, which you might think, those look pretty gerrymandered, but Pennsylvania in general in 2015 was pretty bad. So here are ones that were placed into category three. And then category four, these are the three worst offenders, which do look pretty bad. So we compared our results to the medial whole ratio because that was our inspiration. And this is just the examples of ones where our ratio put a district into a category that differed by two or more from the medial whole ratio. 
So the medial whole ratio said this district was in category one and this one too, but ours put that those districts in category three. So, you know, again, this is subjective, but you can decide whether you think this, who's right, <laughs> category one or category three. Um, this one right here, this was one of our worst offenders and this was only a, you know, potential gerrymandering according to the medial whole. This one, um, I don't know, maybe I'll give it to them on this one. They put this in category three and ours was in category one. And then these, according to the medial whole, these were um, like two ones with very high medial whole ratios and these were both pretty low for us, so. Um, and then just I'll end with, are things better in 2018? So this is the redrawn map in 2018 taken from Kevin's paper, this figure is. And so just looking at them, they, they do look a lot better. There's still some funny business, but they do look a lot better. And for us, all of the EDF ratios in 2018 ended up being less than 1.5, which put them in category one. This was our highest for 2018. It was almost 1.5, but still safely in the first category. The medial whole ratio, on the other hand, they, you know, the numbers generally decreased, but they all, they said that districts, so 4, 6, 12, 13, and 15, so 4, 6, 12, that one looks pretty bad, 13, 12 and 13 were the two highest EDF ratios as well, and 15 were all still very highly gerrymandered for them, and some of the other ones were like in category 2 or category two or three. So, um, so they didn't, I mean, they definitely saw an overall trend of improvement, but not as much as we did. So, um, but the thing that we like about the EDF ratio is that it is stable and it's not significantly influenced by the number of medial access branches or the area of a given district. So let me stop there, thanks. So everybody can, um or should unmute themselves and please uh, applaud for our speaker. <laughs> okay, do we have any questions? You can unmute yourself, Don. Yeah, I was, just wait I was waiting to be called on. <laughs> Donald. Um, so uh, in a lot of these cases, there's also this population density difference in different areas. So do any of these metrics also consider not just distances, but in some sense a kind of transportation plan or actually moving mass? Because if I put a little yeah. line out to get a big city, uh, somehow the shape isn't as important as the population I captured. The population, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't, I, since I'm not, this is like my first foray into the gerrymandering literature, I'm not sure if there have, but I imagine that probably there are people that take into account compactness measures with population. That's a good point. Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know. There was just a recent paper by Justin Solomon and some other people who now I can't remember, just in, I think, 2020 where they looked at a lot of different measures of compactness and gave implementations for all of them, and also pointed out the problems with compactness measures and in general how, um, you know, different parameters affect stability and so that there's, there's problems with all compactness measures. And maybe there's something in there that would Maybe just a quick follow-up. So my question, I actually wasn't so much interested in the political aspect as the mathematical one in this case, because it seems that there's probably room for many interesting questions regarding medial axis-like objects for shapes with a measure on top of them. Yeah. Where, where you want to understand not just distances, but distances plus the measure. Plus the measure. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay, so we have, um, I believe, uh, Yanis raised his hand, so you can ask the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, some of this, some of these measures are sensitive to noise, but I wonder, is there is there a way to actually measure how much noise is going on by these uh, by these numbers by these measures? 
Yes, and I want to say that I should have actually read this paper more carefully, but I want to say that in Justin Solomon, et cetera's paper, they did do some sort of quantification of that. Um, I'm not sure about that though. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up, but that's a good question. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Kechi Nadi. Uh, in the section on image analysis, how would the resolution of the image affect the results? Oh, good question. I mean, um, yeah, so we, we would want um, as good resolution as possible to get, you know, an actual good edge map, I guess. So I guess it's however the resolution affects segmentation algorithms is how it would affect mine. So, um, yeah, as long as you could, as long as your segmentation algorithm would pick up, you know, some contrasting parts so that they could get edges, you'd be okay, but. Any other questions? Uh, so actually, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, I'm wondering, to address questions of stability, is there a fuzzy notion of, um, of a medial axis as a distribution rather than as a set? that would allow, I mean, so for example, as Henry pointed out, if you take something convex and you move it a little bit, you have some <laughs> big discontinuity. Is there a sense in which you could imagine changing the angle and then something goes from zero to one, uh, some, some, you know, some region has the weights changed? Yes. Um... Oh, I, I'm like trying to pull from something in the back of my head back from back in the day. I feel like there is something like this. Let me think about it and I'll get back to you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Off the top of my head, I don't have That's a good fine. answer, but there's something in there. I'll think about it. <laughs> I had a, uh, a question for folks or a challenge. Me, I just wanted to get this on YouTube, but I'd be interested in seeing an image created by this fire burning process. So you actually create a boundary, you find the right material, you light it on fire, and then the medial axis is left. I think uh, yeah, as long as you don't burn down your apartment, this would be a great contribution <laughs> right. to, the, uh, exactly. to the community. I actually, when I, when, for my thesis defense in grad school, I really wanted to do that. And I was like gathering the materials and then I thought, you know what, <laughs> probably don't need to do that. So I didn't, but that's a great, I, I fully support that. There are videos with sand where you have a, a oh, pile no. of sand that around a polygon and you release it and the ridges of the sand give you the medial axis. Nice. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Cool. <laughs>